We've had a good look at least squares, so now it's time to look at its twin, least norm. So again, in our problem setup, we've got a vector y that equals a matrix A times a vector x. But this time A is a fat matrix, and that means it has fewer rows than columns. This means that we have an underdetermined system of equations. All that means is that we have more variables than equations. So actually that means that there are infinitely many solutions for x. No matter what y we are given, we can always find some x to satisfy this equation. And in fact, we can find infinitely many x's to solve y equals ax. So this means we have basically infinite freedom in our choice for x. But we can use that freedom to satisfy some other constraint. Well then you might ask, what kind of constraint should we consider? So here's where least norm comes in. It turns out a very natural constraint to have is to minimize the norm of x. We can have any x we want to satisfy this equation, but we want to choose the x that has the smallest norm. So it turns out that any solution to ax equals y can be expressed as some particular solution plus some vector in the null space of a. So this equation here seems complex, but it's very simple. The particular solution, xp, here is just any x that can solve ax equals y for a given a and a given y, right? Just any old solution. And we just mentioned that there are infinitely many solutions to solve this equation, right? All this is saying is that if you know even just one solution to ax equals y, let's call that solution xp, then you can find all the other infinitely many solutions by just taking each vector in the null space of a and adding it to xp. So this fact actually provides some really important insight into solving the problem, into finding the x with the minimum norm. So let's look at this graphically. Alright, so I have some equation ax equals y, and remember I'm given the a and I'm given the y, and here we have two dimensions. So a is again a fat matrix, and it's 1 by 2, so let's be very careful about what we're plotting here. So in the least squares lecture, we plotted y2 against y1, the outputs, but now this is very different. We're plotting x2 against x1. We're looking at the inputs, right? We're not interested in the output in y because we can always find some x to satisfy y. But this time we're concerned about the input. We want to find one particular value of x1, x2 that will minimize the norm. So this pink line here represents all the x's, the x1, x2's, that can solve the equation ax equals y. So note that this is a line. Right, we have infinitely many solutions. You pick any point on this line, it's going to satisfy this equation, right? So this type of set is actually called an affine subspace. So if you remember from an earlier lecture, we talked about subspaces, and a subspace is defined by two properties, scalar multiplication and vector addition, right? If you have some vector in the set and you scale the vector, that scaled vector will still be in the set. And if you have two vectors in the set, if you add them together, you get a third vector that's still in the set. Now in this case, for this pink line, neither of those are true. And that's because if we consider a point on this pink line, the vector that represents that point starts at the origin and goes to that point on the line. Now there's no vector that will lie perfectly on the line, right? So that means if we scale that vector, the tip of that vector is not going to end up on the line. It's going to extend further. So for example, here's our origin. If we have some point here, there's a vector that goes like this. If we scale that, if we make it bigger or smaller, obviously we're not going to be on the line anymore. Now, if we have a vector that goes like this, and then another vector that goes like this, we're going to end up with a vector sum that goes something like this. So that's also not going to be on the line in general. So this is pretty different from the subspaces we talked about before. This is an affine subspace. Now, let's look at a different problem, which is ax equals zero. So I have the same matrix A here, but I replaced Y with the zero vector. And I plotted it here with a blue line. So this blue line represents the infinitely many x1, x2s that satisfy AX equals zero. So this is actually a subspace. And if you want to be unambiguous, you can call this a linear subspace. This satisfies the requirements that the set be closed under scalar multiplication and vector addition. One important thing to know about linear subspaces is that they always include the zero vector. Affine subspaces never include the zero vector, but there's a simple relationship here which you can see geometrically. If you take a linear subspace and you translate it by a vector, then you'll end up with an affine subspace. So now we're going to look at the relationship between these two problems. We want to solve the problem represented by the pink line, but the blue line is going to help us a lot. So let me rewrite these equations using set notation. 
So the pink line is all x such that ax equals y. And the blue line is all values of x such that ax equals 0. So the bottom one here should be very familiar. This is actually the null space of a. It's all x's that make ax equal 0. So now let me consider some point on the pink line. Some x1, x2 that satisfies ax equals y. So again, I can draw this as a vector. So the vector starts at the origin and ends on the pink point. And the vector itself does not lie on the pink line. But if I pick some vector in the null space, right, some vector that lies on the blue line, then I can just add the blue vector to the pink vector and I get some new solution that satisfies ax equals y. So I can do this for any blue vector. Here's another one. And it should be pretty obvious that no matter what pink point I pick on the pink line, I can always keep the same pink vector, but just change the blue vector to reach all of those points, those infinitely many points. So that's what I was talking about when I said, if you have a particular solution, in this case, the pink arrow, you can leave that particular solution alone, but just add all the possible xn's, all the possible vectors in the null space to that pink vector to reach any pink point that you want. So far, this pink vector has been just some arbitrary vector that I picked. But now let's consider a very special xp. So let's look at this red vector and note that it's perpendicular to the blue line. So I'm going to call this xln. And note that any pink point can be reached by translating from the origin by xn and then adding xln. So it should be pretty obvious that ln isn't a random choice of letters. It's the least norm solution. So it should be pretty obvious geometrically that if I'm looking for the shortest vector that goes from the origin to the pink line, that's going to be this perpendicular vector that I've drawn here. So I've actually removed the blue arrows. So I'm not adding anything from the null space. If I add something to the null space, some vector, it's just going to make the resultant vector longer. The best thing I can do is just use xln, the least norm solution. So going back real quick, this solution here is longer than the least norm solution because I've added the vector xn. And you can tell just from the Pythagorean theorem that any x where the xn is non-zero is going to be longer than xln by itself. So if I have some pink point, some solution to ax equals y, then I can make the norm of x shorter by just subtracting some vector in the null space from it. And that's exactly what I did here. And one last piece of intuition here. All I'm doing here is taking the origin, the zero vector, and projecting it onto the pink line. Whatever pink point I get there, that is the least norm solution. So just to spell things out here, xln is shorter than any other x that satisfies ax equals y. So geometrically, I'm done. I found the least norm solution. And xln is perpendicular. It's orthogonal to the null space of A. If I want to shift the blue line to reach the pink line, the shortest vector that will do that translation is the least norm solution. So now that we know how to do things geometrically, let's find a closed form solution. But first, we need to talk about Lagrange multipliers. So many of you have probably come across this before in some math class or even some economics class, but I feel like they're never taught very well. I'm not going to go into all the gory details of it, but I'm going to give you the intuition behind it and show you how to use it. So we have an optimization problem here, and we're going to minimize the function f of x subject to the constraint g of x equals zero. And remember, these are all vectors, so x is a vector, zero is a vector. And just some terminology here, the top part here is called an objective function. That's the thing that we're trying to minimize. And the thing at the bottom, those are the equality constraints. And remember, it's a vector equation, so we have several constraints. So the method of Lagrange multipliers is an elegant way to solve this problem. And the basic intuition is that normally, when we want to minimize some function, we take its derivative and set it to zero. But we can't do that here because we have these equality constraints. But we can do a little trick here that will make this tractable. So let's combine the objective function and the equality constraints into one function. So this is different from the original problem, right? We're making up some new function here, L of x lambda. And the way we make this function is we just take the objective function and we add the product of the equality constraints and this vector lambda. So just some more terminology here. The L here, this function is called the Lagrangian function. And the lambda vector, 
This is called the Lagrange multiplier. So the idea here is that if we minimize the Lagrangian function, that's the same as solving the original problem. So the thing is, the Lagrangian function is a function of x and of lambda. So we actually need to take the gradients of L with respect to x and with respect to lambda. So we minimize L in two steps. First, we hold lambda constant and take the gradient of L with respect to the vector x and set that equal to zero. We're going to get some equation. Next, as a separate equation, we're going to hold x constant and let lambda vary. So we're going to take the gradient of L with respect to the vector lambda and set that equal to zero. Now we have two different equations. So we solve those equations for x and lambda, and that will give us x such that we satisfy the equality constraints of the original problem, and we've minimized the objective function as much as possible. So this may seem mysterious, but the reason this works is that the Lagrangian function is not just some random function that people put together. It's constructed very carefully. So g of x, the constraints, that is the only thing that is being multiplied by lambda. So if we take the gradients of L with respect to lambda, the f of x term has no lambda there, so that just goes to zero. And the lambda transpose g of x term, there's just one lambda vector there, so we just get g of x. So in other words, the gradient of L with respect to lambda is just g of x. And we're going to set that equal to zero, so we get g of x equals zero. But that's the equality constraint. So the intuition there is that I want to take the derivative of something and set it to zero to do my optimization, but because of the equality constraints in the original problem, it's not clear how to do that. But the Lagrangian function is very clever because we basically embed the equality constraints into the derivative of L. And because we compute the gradient of L with respect to x and with respect to lambda, we're only going to end up with x's and lambdas that satisfy the equality constraints, but also minimize f of x. So let's apply this to the least norm problem. So originally, the least norm problem was to minimize the norm of x. But because the norm is always non-negative, that's the same as minimizing x transpose x. And in this case, our equality constraints are ax equals y. So note that this is a little bit different from the previous setup. We had g of x equals 0. So to get this into that form, we just do ax minus y equals 0. So now we can construct the Lagrangian function. L of x lambda equals x transpose x plus lambda transpose times the quantity ax minus y. So the rest of this is just a mechanical process. We take the gradient of L with respect to x and set it to zero. So we get 2x plus a transpose lambda equals zero. We do the same thing for lambda and we get ax minus y equals zero. So now it's just algebra. We have two equations and just cleaning things up here. We can rearrange the top equation as x equals negative a transpose lambda over 2, and we just plug that into x in the bottom equation, so we get negative a a transpose lambda over 2 minus y equals 0. So rearranging that, we get lambda expressed in terms of a and y. And a and y are constants given to us. So now we just plug this into the top equation, and we get our least norm solution. x ln equals a transpose times the inverse of a a transpose times y. So there you have it. Now this should look vaguely familiar. So let's step back for a second. If A is a square matrix and invertible, we just take its inverse and we can solve the equation y equals ax. But if A is skinny, we use least squares. And if A is fat, we use least norm. And the closed form solution for least squares looks like this. And we just derived the closed form solution for least norm, which looks like this. So these two look like very close cousins. And in fact, both of these matrices are called the Moore-Penrose inverse, or the pseudo-inverse. So if A is skinny, the Moore-Penrose inverse is given by what you see up there. And if A is fat, the Moore-Penrose inverse is given by a different formula, which is the one we just derived. So the formula depends on whether A is skinny or fat. And one last thing that you should always remember is that in either case, A must be full rank. But being full rank is not at all a restrictive condition. Because, for instance, if A is skinny and it's not full rank, that means you have some redundant columns. So you can just keep removing columns until you don't have any redundant ones anymore. If A is fat, that means you have some redundant rows. So you can just keep removing rows until nothing's redundant anymore. And you don't have to even do that by hand. You can do that using software. And actually, it's very easy to write your own function in NumPy to do this. I'll let you think about that one.
So here we are. We have two different formulas for the Moore-Penrose inverse, depending on the matrix A. By the way, this is not the last time we'll see the pseudo-inverse. Toward the end of the course, we'll have something very interesting to say about it. Alright, now let's look at a really cool application. Bioelectromagnetics. So what the hell is that? That has to do with electroencephalography, or EEG. So basically, you put a bunch of electrodes on somebody's head, and you measure the voltage at different points on their scalp, and try to reconstruct the electrical activity in their brain. And alternatively, there's something called magnetoencephalography. And what is going on here? I mean, this looks crazy. Imagine having your head plugged into one of these things. Alright, so clearly EEGs are a little bit easier to do, but both of them have a similar concept behind them. So let me give you a little background here. When your neurons fire, they allow a little bit of current to flow through. And actually, this creates what's called a current dipole. So basically, there's a region of negative charge and positive charge. And this creates an electric field inside of your head. And you have all these neurons in your head, and you could think of it, instead of just individual neurons, as big groups of neurons. But even then, each of those different groups creates its own electric field. And all those electric fields add together to create a very complicated electric field all throughout your head. And basically, if you have electrodes on your scalp, then you can measure this electric field and see how it varies with space and time. Based on those readings, you're trying to figure out what these current dipoles in your head look like. Basically, that tells you what parts of your brain are electrically active. So here's another great diagram. On the left, we have a model of a neuron, and we are modeling the voltage around it. In the middle, as you zoom out away from this neuron, you can see the electric field more clearly. And on the right-hand side, you also produce a magnetic field. And from far away, it looks like this. There are lots of medical and biophysics papers out there modeling neurons in different ways to figure out what these electric fields and magnetic fields look like. And it turns out a very common model actually looks like this equation. So this is just a matrix equation. And on the left-hand side, D is a vector. And each element of this vector is a voltage measured by one of the m different electrodes on the patient's head. On the right-hand side, we have the vector s, which has n elements, each of which is the amplitude of a current source. And again, you can think of a current source as a neuron or a cluster of neurons. And finally, in the middle, we have an m by n matrix, L, called the lead field matrix. And that sounds pretty cool. So the lead here refers to the electrode leads on the patient's head. So the currents produced by the different neurons are transformed by the lead field matrix to produce the voltages measured in the EEG. And typically when you perform an EEG, you only have a few dozen, or at most maybe a few hundred different electrodes, so this means L has at most a few hundred rows. On the other hand, the vector S could have a huge number of elements. After all, you're modeling different neurons, or clusters of neurons, and there are going to be millions there. Of course you're not going to attempt to model every single neuron, but even the simplest brain models will have a lot of elements here. So this all means that the lead field matrix is a fat matrix. A very fat matrix. But this is perfect for least norm. We multiply D by the pseudo inverse of L, and there we have it, our estimate of S. Our estimate of the current amplitudes of the neuron clusters. In the field of bioelectromagnetics, this is called the minimum norm estimate. And it's just the least norm solution. Now you might be wondering, is this simple model really useful? But it really is, and let me show you why. So let's go back to high school physics. The power in a circuit is equal to the current times the voltage. You might also remember a different equation, V equals IR. The voltage in a circuit equals the current times the resistance. This is Ohm's law. Now if we plug in Ohm's law into the top equation, we get power equals current squared times R. So if we know the current and the resistance of a neuron, or a cluster of neurons, we can find the power consumed by that cluster. So think about this. To find the total power expended by the brain, you can just add the power of all the different clusters of neurons. That's what I'm doing on the left-hand side here. And on the right-hand side, I'm going to assume that the resistance for all these different clusters is roughly the same, which is a reasonable assumption. And I'm going to pull out the R. And I just add all these different terms. So I1 is the current through the first cluster, I2 is the current through the second cluster, and so on. And I'm just going to factor out the R. So this gives us the total power in all the different circuits in the brain. So if I just write this a little bit cleaner, on the left-hand side, I have the total power. And this is equal to I transpose I times R, where I is just a vector of all the different currents, and R is a scalar. So the total power expended by the brain is proportional 
to I transpose I. But holy shit, this is the least norm objective function. This shit blows my mind. Take a look at that beauty right there. We started out with some basic physics, some biology assumptions, and pow, we got the least norm problem out of nowhere. That is a mindfuck. So putting everything together, the least norm solution corresponds to the minimum power exerted by the brain. And this makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint. The brain has evolved to become very efficient. So if you measure a bunch of different voltages on the scalp, it's pretty reasonable to assume that the brain produced those voltages in a way that minimizes the power that it needed to burn. Now, this last explanation, honestly, it's half bullshit. But even if it turns out not to be true, it's pretty reasonable. And to analyze something as complicated as the brain, you really need to make a lot of reasonable assumptions to make the problem tractable. To wrap up, let me quickly go over a few resources. So there's a great paper on the topic by Olaf Hock called Keep It Simple, a case for using classical minimum norm estimation in the analysis of EEG and MEG data. And this paper is the best written explanation on the topic I found. There's the D equals LS equation here, and he goes into detail explaining it. And he goes over the null space and least norm and all that stuff. And actually, the great thing about this paper is that he looks at not just the null space, but a couple other approaches, including the maximum likelihood approach. And this is a statistical approach. And basically, even from these other approaches, at the end of the day, the solution reduces down to the least norm solution. So all these different approaches are equivalent. And the amazing thing is, with the tools that we have so far, you can read and understand most of this paper already. On the software side, there's something called MNE. And actually, there's a Python subproject inside of it. And this is a great toolkit for EEG and MEG analysis. So you can look at the code here. There's lots of different examples and really great visualizations. Here's another software toolkit called FieldTrip. And this is actually for MATLAB, not for Python. But you can see a lot of interesting code snippets, visualizations, and tutorials here. There are also some really great explanations on YouTube. So this here is a great talk by Professor Hamalainen given at MIT. And as far as I know, Hamalainen was the first person to introduce least norm to the analysis of EEG and MEG. So he is the OG. Last but not least, there's an excellent talk by Professor Ustenveld on the mathematical details and other intricacies. I really like this talk because his explanations are very clear, but also his voice is just so soothing. Anyway, I've put links to all these resources in the description. So that's it for least norm. We saw some geometric reasoning, we derived the closed form solution using Lagrange multipliers, and finally we looked at a really cool application. I hope this showed you the power of least norm and how it can unexpectedly but naturally show up in different applications. Next time, we're going to keep building our toolset by looking at something called QR factorization.